Archaeology is a reminder of assignments. What are we at? Um, less, yeah, less than a week left. Okay, so I've had lots of questions about them. Just a reminder that this due date is coming up really fast. Uh, and just a couple of uh, things to say about it. Um, if you haven't looked at it, now obviously now is the time to really dig into this. It's worth 15% of your grade. Um, so all of this is stuff that I've told you before. I'm just repeating some things based on some of the questions I've had. First, make sure you pick something off the list. Okay, if you pick something not off the list, I can't guarantee I'll agree to your assignment. Okay, I, I do not like to have the same uh, topics every year uh, just to sort of prevent plagiarism and things like that. Um, and, um, you know, there are other topics that are acceptable, but I need to approve them because there are some things that just don't work out very well for this kind of assignment. Um, number two, make sure you have these headings. Okay, I appreciate creativity, but I'm marking each section one at a time. If I can't find the section, it's hard for me to give you marks. If it's there and it's frustrating for me to find it, you don't want me to be frustrated while I'm grading your assignment. Fair enough. All right, you can add extra stuff. You can add subheadings. You can, you know, like I said, creativity is great. Uh, just make sure you do have all these sections because this is what I'm looking for when I actually grade it, okay? So uh, make sure you do read the instructions for each of these on the instruction sheet. Uh, some things may be very relevant to your organism. For example, classification, gram negative or gram positive, that's very relevant if you have a, a, a bacterium. Not important if you have a virus, right? For example, uh, so make sure you read the instructions and that's part of the assignment is for you to tease out what the relevant information is. Uh, you know, in terms of things like life cycles, uh, if you have a tapeworm, uh, the life cycle is really important to the in infectiousness of it, right? It's a, let's say it's a pork tapeworm, right? So the life cycle involves a pig. And so eating uh, undercooked pork is, is really essential to transmission all that. Uh, for viruses, I don't need you to get into the nitty gritty details of the life cycles. It's more important uh, things like what tissues it infects, does it have animal reservoirs, uh, you know, how people are getting it around the disease and transmission. Okay, any questions do reach out to me and I can certainly help you with that. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at the grading sheet I have on there. Um, it, it's just following the, uh, the question or the uh, assignment sheet. Uh, but if you want to take a peek at that, this is basically how I'm grading it. And I'll, I'll offer you comments as well. So um, some questions about the references, okay? Um, so this is not a, a, this is not an essay, right? I'm not looking for citations or any necessarily standard format of how you're doing this, okay? There's two things that are essential. One is anything that is not your own, which is I'm assuming is your any images you're using might be off of uh, websites. Um, you're going to include a reference for that. You can include it with the image or you can put it at the end if you can't figure out how to do that. That's okay. Um, most of the information that you are finding is going to be what I'm falling under the category of, um, we'll call it general knowledge. So I'm not worried about the citations, uh, but I am worried about people um, uh, using things word for word and I'll talk about that in a moment. But what you do need to do is have three references. So if you've ever read a book or a chapter or something like that, sometimes they have a bibliography at the end, which is kind of like, uh, you know, if you're looking for more information, so that's what your references should be, okay? I want to see three excellent sources that if, oh, I'm reading about your tuberculosis project and I want to know more about tuberculosis, okay? So you want to have three nice um, references in that particular category, all right? Um, at least one of them must not be a web source. Okay, if you want to use the class textbook, that's fine. Um, another textbook, that's fine. Uh, it just better be a good one. Okay, uh, the other two can be web sources and make sure you don't just put the URL, the address. Okay, I want to see the author. Okay, and the author uh, may not be a person. It may be like the Canadian, let's say, uh, you know, public health agency or an organization or something like that. And uh, I want to see uh, the title. Okay, um, so the title, I mean, it could just be tuberculosis, right, or something like that. All right, any questions about that? Yeah. Are we allowed to embed 
you are allowed to have more than three if you like, but just don't make it excessive. Okay, like I said, I want them to be kind of just, just nice references that uh, I might want to, you know, find more information. And uh, the web links will probably click on them to see if they're if they look good. If it's some sort of sketchy Bob's Bugs web page made by another student, that's not good, right? Not necessarily. I'm not looking for citations. Like I said, I'm just I'm, I'm looking to see that you have some good resources. Um, you know, this is not a citation essay exercise. It's different, right? Um, okay. Don't forget. Um, I need your plagiarism recognition certificate course. I think I've got 42 of them, and I think we have 62 students or something like that. So about 20 of you. Uh, if you haven't uploaded it, um, do that. If you haven't done it. You need to do it because I'm not going to grade your assignment without it. Okay, a question here? Um, instead of a textbook or a book, can you use like a scholarly article? Yeah, perfectly fine. Okay. Yeah. Is there a question over here? Thank you. We're drinking coffee. That's okay. I saw movement in my eye just sort of out of the corner of my eye, right? Um, and then hand, okay. Uh, do not quote, okay? This isn't history English class where you're quoting some character, okay? Please don't do that. Um, it just use your own words. Okay, so what does that mean? It means, you know, you can read the source and then look away and type the sentence using your own vocabulary and whatnot. Okay, uh, these are going to be when you handed them in, uh, when you hand them in, they are going to be scanned through a software that looks for plagiarism. So anything that's word for word is going to get flagged. Uh, and so that's going to be a problem if you if you uh, if you've done that. And part of the problem is if you've just copied from a source, then you haven't done the work and I can't give you the grade for that. Okay, if you have any questions about that, let me know. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use, you know, certain words like, uh, you know, if they're talking about tuberculosis, they might be talking about coughing. You can't, it's not like you can't use the word cough, but the sentence has to be your own sentence. Okay, uh, and, and uh, like I said, I, I find for me, the best way to do is kind of look at the source and read it and understand it. And then, you know, type my own thing up, you know, without looking at it, without peeking, because then I'm too tempted to use their words. Uh, and then look back, you know, maybe see, okay, did I get the, get the right gist of it? Uh, so when you hand it in, uh, everything is going to be handed in online. Uh, if you're doing a fact sheet or a pamphlet, and if you want to give me a physical copy, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Uh, it's great. I love them. I'm not going to give you bonus marks for that. Um, everything is going to be marked digitally, but it's, it's great to see these things in, in front and, and uh, you know, they're very beautiful. Um, if you're doing a website, uh, you're going to hand in the URL. So that's the, um, the web address. Okay. Uh, and if you're doing a website, I also want you to hand in um, a Word document just with the text because that's, uh, that's going to get scanned by the plagiarism uh, software. Um, otherwise, I have to copy and paste it from your website and all that. It just gets really complicated. Okay. So make sure you do that. Uh, it doesn't need to look pretty. It just needs to be the text so that it can be, it can be scanned properly. Any questions? Okay, hopefully pretty straightforward. Like I said, reach out to me. Oh, I'll check my emails. Yeah. How many words are we supposed to write? Uh, there's no necessarily word limit. It kind of depends on your format. If you're doing a fact sheet, it's two pages is what I'm looking for. So that's a bit more tight. And a website is going to be a little bit more flexible. I don't want you to go crazy. Um, you know, but a website is probably going to be a little bit more informative because there's more flexibility around that. Um, and uh, so, you know, you know, two pages of text on a, on a pamphlet is, is going to be uh, like it's probably the font's probably going to be smaller than 12 points and all that. So I don't know what that translates to number of words, but uh, to give you an idea. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, it's totally fine. It doesn't require. So if you have one from the previous year, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to check to see if there's any questions here. No questions there. Okay. Like I said, email me if you have any questions. Uh, or come and drop by my office. And uh, these usually, um, you know, in some ways are one of the highlights of my year. Uh, it's a lot of work grading them. It takes two to three weeks to get through them all. Um, but um, I'm always learning something from these. And uh, because they're all so different, they're, they're kind of fun to look at. And that's an opportunity for you to boost your grade. Usually the average grade is around 80%. That's about 12 out of 15. So some people, this is a good opportunity to boost your grade. Uh, if you go back to the, um, 
the grading sheet. Where's the grading sheet? There it is. You can see that I do have some grades for, um, which one is it here? Four grades out of 15 are for presentation. So that means that you're having, you know, nice, uh, clear pictures and good colors and, you know, things like that. Um, you know, so for example, avoid having, let's say, a yellow font on a green background or something like that. Um, you know, and that things are, like I said, clear and nice and, and pretty and all those kind of things as well. So, you know, if you clean it up, spend a little bit of time making it look really nice, it's definitely worth it. All right, so. So back to epidemiology and disease transmission. So last time we were uh, defining a bunch of things, right? So like epidemic versus pandemic, and can't remember what else we defined, but a bunch of things like that. And we we're talking about how uh, epidemiology is making use of, uh, you know, usually a lot of statistics and whatnot. And we're going to transition now to a little bit more about disease transmission and some of the methods that that is done. So first one for you is just another definition for you is uh, sometimes we talk about communicable diseases. And that means uh, things that are spread uh, usually from person to person, right? Or one host to another. Uh, so that includes many of the diseases we're talking about. Uh, anything like, like the cold or the flu, you can imagine somebody sneezes or coughs and uh, that's gonna have virus particles that are gonna be spread to another person. So we'll get into some examples uh, of these things as well. But I also wanted to define non-communicable disease um, a lot of places when you see non-communicable disease, they often talk about lifestyle diseases. So maybe you're getting cancer because you are a smoker or um, you have diabetes because you have, uh, you're, um, you're overweight and have a bad diet or, or something like that. And you can see that I found this little figure that's talking about some of these, uh, some of these things. Um, but uh, what they're often missing from the list is there are other non-communicable diseases, meaning diseases you're not getting from another person or, or animal, um, but you can get um, microbial diseases from other places, right? So I think I have two examples there. Uh, one is where you're getting um, ill from your own microbes. So the classic example is um, we have E. coli, it's in our intestine, and uh, maybe it gets into your bladder instead. So now you had something that's normal and commensal with you, not causing any issues, and now it's in your bladder causing a bladder infection. Uh, the other example is microbes that aren't necessarily found in other hosts, but might be found environmentally. So soil microorganisms are a good example of that. And uh, you can see I have an example here as a, a Clostridium botulinum, which causes botulism. So we'll talk about botulism just a little bit here today. Um, not, not a ton, but uh, there's a, a few examples of where uh, botulism uh, is, is a concern. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is, first of all, before we get into transmission, is where the microbes come from, right? So we call this the reservoir. So this is a uh, reservoir is kind of, you can think of it as their normal place to be, their normal habitat. I hate to use the word habitat, because when I think of habitat, I think of animals living, in, you know, rivers or, or, or swamps or, or whatever, right? Um, so reservoir is the word that we use, okay? So reservoir A is our normal flora. So I just mentioned that, E. coli, um, it's part of your normal flora, it's part of your, um, it's in your intestine, and in some cases it can cause bladder infections, or in some cases E. coli causes other infections. There have been people with uh, um, uh, E. coli pneumonia, E. coli blood infections, uh, you know, due to you know, punctures and things like that that get the E. coli to the wrong place. Number two, human carriers. Hopefully that one's really obvious. We're getting things transmitted from another person. So like I said, you get a cold from someone else, uh, maybe in your household, uh, there's sexually transmitted infections, a uh, whole bunch of, um, a huge list of those. Those are the ones we're probably most familiar with. Uh, number three, animals. So I wanna just talk about zoonoses for a bit here. Um, I think I defined that way back uh, in uh, when we were talking about rabies maybe. Uh, so zoonos. Zoo means animals. I don't know what uh, the word noces ends up in there. Um, must be something Latin or Greek, but this means something that is coming from an animal, right? So I have some um, examples here in a moment. An abiotic, uh, again, uh, the example I gave was botulism. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute or two. So I have, uh, I found some tables that were talking about examples of, of zoonoses. And uh, there's actually quite a few 
Um, people aren't necessarily aware that certain diseases are zoonoses necessarily, right? So influenza, we often do get it from people, but there are uh, quite a few forms that we can get, get from animals as well. Uh, and sometimes it works back and forth. We can actually give it to the animals. Uh, so influenza, there's avian influenza that comes from birds. And uh, sometimes we can get, uh, can we get sick from, uh, from pigs uh, because they can actually be sick with the same viruses. Uh, rabies, that's an obvious one. Usually we're not getting rabies from other people. I don't know if that uh, must have happened at least once, but uh, usually that's not the case. We're getting it from wild animals. Uh, West Nile virus is, um, is actually a bird disease. Uh, humans are not the natural reservoir. There are, are rare cases of where people have gotten it through like a blood transfusion or something like that, but uh, it's actually coming from a bird and uh, uh, from the bird via a mosquito, right? So it is technically an animal disease and a zoonose. Uh, bacterial, we talked about anthrax. Um, usually, uh, um, usually people are getting it from livestock. It is a soil bacterium. Um, but the usual route is people who are handling uh, animals of some sort. So veterinary type people or, or farmers are kind of the common people who are getting uh, cutaneous anthrax. Uh, we talked about bubonic plague from rodents. Um, salmonella is from um, uh, birds and reptiles. So if you have a pet uh, turtle or, or some sort of bird, and uh, you should wash your hands after handling kind of thing, or if you know you're at a friend's house and handling his or her pet snake or something like that. Um, salmonella is part of the normal, um, it's, it's normally found in their feces, and uh, but it can make us sick and, and uh, you know, particularly if we're ingesting it accidentally, right? And Lyme disease, we're going to talk about that later on uh, today as well, uh, found in, in um, um, most commonly uh, a certain type of mouse called the white-footed mouse. So more on Lyme disease, spread by a tick. Uh, there are other um, diseases, um, fungal infections, uh, some of the ringworms, so that's the skin infections, uh, can come from animals, uh, handling animals. Uh, we talked about African sleeping sickness. You can get it actually transmitted from human to human. Usually the vector is the tsetse fly, um, but the most common way that people get it is, is because it's found in animals. And there's actually a lot of wild African animals that don't get sick from it. Um, and so, um, we're not going to get rid of that disease unless we kill all the animals, but that's not going to happen, right? Uh, pork tapeworm, pork tapes. So lots of examples of zoonoses. Um, if you think about uh, SARS-CoV-2, that started off as a zoonose, right? An animal disease, but now it's been transmitted human to human. But it is happening either way. Um, interesting thing about this SARS virus is it does seem to have the ability to infect quite a variety of animals. Uh, they were talking about the I think it was uh, some of the tigers at the zoo in uh, New York were tested and they had the virus because they were kind of sick and they tested them uh, and cats and dogs can get it. And so, um, you know, this is, we don't know if this is a risk or not catching it from your pets. They're not the most likely person you're gonna catch it from. Uh, abiotic, as I mentioned, there's a lot of organisms that live in environmental sources. Uh, the organism that causes cholera can be found naturally in rivers. Uh, and uh, the ones we'll worry about in most of Canada are are soil uh, organisms, uh, usually the clostridium organisms causing a tetanus or botulism. Uh, those are kind of come some of the common ones. Uh, sometimes in hospitals, we're talking about um, organisms that may actually live and be okay on, on medical equipment. Uh, as I mentioned, I want to talk just kind of briefly about botulism. Um, depending on where you are geographically, uh, sometimes it's a little bit more of an issue. Um, if you live in uh, Alaska, uh, there is a practice done by uh, some indigenous people where they're preparing, um, they're per fermenting fish in a certain manner. And uh, sometimes the anaerobic part of that fermentation allows the, the, uh, the botulism organism to, um, to grow, right? And so it's a little bit more of a risk factor for certain people groups, depending on the type of food they're doing. In Canada, uh, the number one source of botulism, believe it or not, is uh, from canned uh, prepared foods that people have done at home. So I don't know if anyone's done this kind of canning or not, you know, maybe you've made jelly or jam, but uh, you might know part of the procedure is you're trying to sterilize the jars and, uh, you know, you're boiling them and whatnot, but that's may not necessarily get rid of the endospores. And um, so these things, you know, typically people prepare the food, it's stored maybe in a box in the basement or something like that. And eventually those uh, organisms, they're uh, 
you know, there's no oxygen in the system, they have a chance to grow up and that can become an issue. So it's pretty rare. Most people are doing okay with this. You can see the number of cases in Alberta the last five years. We're averaging less than one case a year. So that's, that's good news. Um, but it does happen once in a while. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that uh, in the grocery store. Every once in a while, if the grocery store is not careful, they don't clean these out. Or maybe you've had this happen in your pantry, but you might have a canned food, like not, not just the jars, but an actual can and it's kind of swollen. Has anyone ever seen that? Yeah, my, my parents were famous for having like canned food and it just stuff getting shoved to the back. And, and um, if you ever see that, get rid of that one. That's probably clustered botulinum. Uh, if you open it up and it's black, don't eat it, <laughs> right? Um, there's probably a few images you can find on the internet of black food and that people have thrown out. Um, and, and sometimes that's a real organism. Uh, the other case, which I was trying to look to find if there are any cases in Canada, and I couldn't find any actual evidence of cases of this in Canada. But if you have, um, if you have a baby, um, you may know that it's recommended that you never feed your baby honey. I don't know if anyone's ever heard that. Um, and uh, that's because sometimes like honey is not pasteurized or anything like that. Uh, and, um, and sometimes uh, there are uh, the endospores found in honey. And so um, for some reason, um, botulinum is able to grow and germinate in infant stomachs a lot easier than anybody else's stomach. So kind of the recommendation is don't give honey to anybody less than a year old. Um, but like I said, I couldn't find any evidence of any actual cases in Canada. Um, so I don't, yeah, I mean, it's just something I know a little bit about. Okay, let's talk about transmission of disease. Okay, so you have the reservoir where the organism is hanging out and it's its home. And then there's several ways it can get from uh, where it's starting, its reservoir, uh, to, um, to a human, right? So there's kind of three categories here. Uh, contact. Uh, vehicle and vector. So we're going to break each of these down kind of step by step. So contact, you can see it's broken into three categories, direct, indirect, and, and droplet contact. So let's talk about that for a couple of minutes and give you some examples of what that might look like. So direct contact. Hopefully that one's relatively obvious. You're touching another human in some way, right? So you can see we have handshake, kiss, sexual bites. By the way, that is not a progression. <laughs> All right, that's my joke for the day. <laughs> um, but you get the idea, right? Uh, indirect contact. So this one's probably the easiest one for people to imagine. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, droplet, uh, or, or sorry, a lot of uh, viruses. Like, you know, right now we're talking about the SARS viruses, uh, um, touching people, any sexually transmitted disease, rabies for biting, obviously, and things like that. And a lot of these diseases will transmit by multiple methods. So a lot of respiratory viruses are found in, in a mucus, and the mucus can be transmitted to you directly through a handshake or a kiss or something like that. Uh, indirect as well, right? So indirect usually means we're talking about fomites. So fomites are inanimate objects, right? So it could include a, um, a doorknob, could include a, um, uh, a toothbrush, right? I don't know if anyone shares their toothbrush with anyone. I don't know, there's a line, right? You know, you sharing toothbrush, I don't know. <laughs> uh, cups, bedding, towels, needles, you can, you can imagine all sorts of things, right? That people are touching. Um, and then droplet. Um, droplet means uh, large droplets. And generally, uh, when people sneeze, most people, when they sneeze, just due to gravity, I'll show you a picture, it doesn't go further than about a meter. So I'll talk about that in a second here. I think I've got a picture. There's the picture, right? So there's a whole bunch of studies on this that have been done, right? And this is why, you know, with, um, with the coronavirus, they're recommending, um, you know, six feet, two meters, right, to give that extra range. So they've done studies on this, and there are certain people, and I don't know whether it's bigger noses or stronger lungs that can sneeze further than a meter, <laughs> um, but uh, generally on average, it's about a meter kind of thing, right? And... Uh, um, Say. Yeah, so this is just, you know, everything's in the dark and they can light it all up. So what's happening here? It's just gravity, right? If you think about this, um, you know, if I, here's a marker, right? I'm going to toss it to you. Eventually it just drops. And that's what happens with the droplets. So this is not airborne. 
And there's questions around the whole uh, COVID-19 about airborne and all these kind of things. I'll talk about that in a second. But this is not airborne, okay? This is direct contact, even though you're not touching the person directly, their droplets are touching. All right, and so like I said, usually we're talking about a, a meter. Um, there is some evidence that, um, you know, in drier seasons, right, the, um, so that would be like now, the air is drier and the droplets, um, you know, can, they, can, they can dry up a bit more and travel just a little bit further. Um, but we're probably getting into the airborne thing. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So this includes all sorts of things, right? Like I said, you've got all sorts of respiratory viruses. You've got all sorts of uh, things like uh, uh, if you're looking at direct contact, uh, uh, norovirus is one I keep mentioning that causes um, um, diarrhea and intense vomiting. That's usually uh, physically touching somebody or touching a fomite. Uh, that doesn't come out in sneezing, but you could maybe imagine vomit traveling that far as well. I don't know. Um, that would be very scary. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting looking back at historical pandemics, right? This is from the 1918 flu. You can see they put in brackets the Spanish flu, and uh, they're talking about some of the same stuff, right? Wearing masks. Uh, you can see it's talking about how it being highly communicable and, and those kind of things, and, and, uh, and also tuberculosis, right, as well. So. And uh, what was I, I thought I had a different image here. And uh, so this was, hold on a second. Yeah, this is the one I was talking about. So this is something they were talking about um, back with the H1N1. They were trying to tell people how to sneeze, right? Don't sneeze into your hand because your hand's going to touch things, sneeze into your sleeve. And there's a, a massive um, uh, campaign to, you know, deal with that pandemic. And, and that was something that was uh, nipped at the bud relatively quickly due to uh, having a, a, a vaccine, and it's not nearly as infectious as the coronavirus, uh, which is which is something nice about the flu. Um, I'll, I'll talk to the, about the coronavirus in a minute. So let, let's talk about typhoid Mary for a moment, okay? Um, this is kind of a really fascinating uh, historical uh, uh, incident. I, I'm not sure exactly the year here. I think it's late 1800s, if I remember correctly. Uh, we have this woman, her name is uh, um, Mary Malone, and um, she was a cook and uh, she cooked for all sorts of people and um, one of her specialties apparently was peaches and cream okay and uh, and it turns out that um, that mary had a salmonella infection right so salmonella typhi causes typhoid fever and um, it can be lethal um, without antibiotics and this is the pre-antibiotic era and so it turns out she was something called an asymptomatic carrier, meaning that she had the infection, but it wasn't causing her to be sick. So again, late 1800s, we're talking about, you know, um, germ theory is there and most people kind of understand it, but not everyone really fully understands it, right? And uh, so she's making people sick, right? And, uh, and people are dying. And the health inspectors, you know, this is, this is late enough in history that we do have health inspectors. Uh, and uh, they're they're kind of like looking and trying to figure out, okay, what's the commonality between these ill people? And they discovered that there was a, a cook that was hired in, in both scenarios. And, you know, he arrives at her house, knocks on the door. She sees a health inspector and runs, <laughs> right? Doesn't even let him ask questions and runs. She doesn't know what's up, but I, I, I don't know if that's something to do with her immigration status or something. I can't remember this whole story. Um, they do catch her and... Um, they're like, look, you're making people sick. You can't cook, okay? If you cook, we're gonna arrest you. She's like, okay, 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 um, yeah. But she doesn't believe them. Um, she does laundry for a while, doesn't make as much money, goes back to cooking. More people are starting to die. They eventually arrest her. And there she is. Uh, uh, she's in a, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, a sanatorium, a uh, place where they're basically quarantining people for life. She's never happy and denied it right to the end of, end of her, uh, her days. Uh, so that's typhoid Mary, right? So here's the question. How was it spread? Chocolate. So chocolate, no chocolate, but peaches and cream. No, right? So either on direct contact or touching people uh, or on fomites, which could have been spoons or anything like that, or by foodborne, which we're going to talk about foodborne in, in a minute. But kind of an interesting story um, of people not understanding what's going on and how uh, it can be invisible. Um, so let's let's talk about 
these other things here, which we call vehicles, right? These are things that the disease can be on. They're different from fomites because these are things that people are more interacting with, like things like eating and, and whatnot. So we talk about water, food, and air, right? Kind of the three essentials for humans. Um, so waterborne diseases. Come on, there we go. So a whole bunch of these, a whole bunch. Um, here's a list. This is probably not a comprehensive list of everything. I put in bold the ones that we're actually talking about in this course, because uh, there's a whole bunch on there. And you can see it, it fits all the categories here. Uh, and so most of the time worldwide, when we're talking about waterborne infections, it's this scenario. Human or animal feces is getting into the water. So most of this is a sanitation thing, right? A lot of these things are um, dealt with by sanitation, water treatment, whatnot. Uh, we talked about like cryptosporidium and giardia as being things that um, um, people may get from, let's say, camping and, and, uh, and getting uh, contaminated water. Um, but, uh, you know, relatively rare. We're looking at, uh, I can't remember the number of cases. I think there were roughly 60 or something cases of giardia in, in Alberta a year. Or, I thought it was 60 or 600. I can't remember the number. So not a huge number, right? So like I said, most of these are water sanitation. Not all of them. There's one kind of exception that I do want to talk about. But you can see, like I said, a pretty big list there. Uh, here's um, a little pie graph. This is US, but Canada is, is pretty much the same in terms of the numbers. And you can see that uh, over there on the left-hand side are all of those organisms that we we're talking about. And then they have this one wedge, which is the exception. This is Legionella. Okay, so Legionella was named after, um, like it was discovered when there was a Legionnaires Convention. So Legionnaires are like people who served in the military. They're obviously a convention. A bunch of them got sick and they got uh, this kind of weird type of pneumonia. It was tracked back to this bacterium and they called it Legionella. Uh, so what is going on with that thing there, right? So it says here, not typically spread in drinking water. So this other graph here. So most waterborne infections, you're ending up with gastro and gastroenteritis, right? So you're looking at um, basically vomiting, diarrhea, cramps, you know, those kind of things, right? Uh, and that makes sense. You're consuming it through your digestive system. It's messing up your digestive system. And sometimes we try to expel things with, through, you know, one, one opening or the other. Um, but Legionella is actually a respiratory uh, illness. So uh, it's worth talking about because in terms of, you know, what we, what are considered waterborne infections, um, it's kind of, you know, it's like half of them in Canada, right? So what's going on with Legionella? Hot tubs. <laughs> um, I didn't know this was a thing. Somebody was telling me about this and I had to look it up, right? Um, a back of the truck hot tub. Anyone do this? No, looks like fun. I don't know. thought that was kind of cool anyway. Um, so a whole bunch of places where mists are formed, right? So I don't know if anyone here owns a hot tub and has had to deal with all the chemicals and all those kind of things. There's good reason for that because a hot tub is an incubator, right? It's got warm water in it. Uh, microorganisms can thrive there. Legionella being kind of the number one. It's found in the environment, but it really loves kind of warm water. It's anywhere where you're going to find warm water, right? So hot tubs, you can see some other areas here. Uh, cooling towers um, for um, air conditioning units. So I don't really know exactly how air conditioners work in terms of uh, air conditioners for large buildings. But my understanding is that on the top of the roof of these large buildings, um, you know, because air conditioners are taking heat out of a building and the heat is put through the water and somehow the heat is dissipated and then, you know, the cool water goes back. I, I don't know how it works. All I know is they have these big units on top of large buildings. We're talking about big apartment buildings. And this is a hot spot for Legionella. And part of that water, while it's cooling down, creates mist. And uh, every once in a while, there was, a, there was an outbreak last year. I can't even remember which city it was. Somewhere in the States where there was a big Legionella outbreak. And it was a whole bunch of people. And literally, you know, it was all these people lived within one block of this one building where the cleaning tower had not been cleaned in years. And uh, it had been misting out onto the streets. And, and uh, you know, I think like 15 people got sick or something like that. So this is something that happens once in a while, right? And, uh, and in Canada, we're talking about the hot tubs probably being kind of the number one thing. So let's talk a little bit about Legionella. <clears throat> um, it's causing a, a type of pneumonia. It's getting into the lungs from people inhaling it. 
um, has a whole bunch of names, uh, Legionella's or Legionnaire's disease, uh, Pontiac fever. I, I don't really know um, why it has all so many different names, but kind of a pneumonia. So we're talking about coughing and fever and, you know, aches kind of, you know, very similar pneumonia. Okay, so let's talk about foodborne infection. Again, there's a big long list here. And often we're also talking about fecal contamination, right? So it makes sense, right? Because of course, this is a digestive thing and people are expelling things from their digestive system. Um, and if the pathogens are there, ends up in food, uh, it's gonna make somebody else sick. Uh, there's a whole bunch of these. This is kind of the, uh, this is the number five list, or sorry, top five list in Canada. Uh, and you can see the number of cases and number of hospitalizations and all those kind of things. So we talked about, uh, again, I have them in bold. We're not gonna talk about Campylobacter, um, but it is a common um, type of uh, a foodborne illness. Uh, Listeria, we talked about Salmonella. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit more about E. coli um, next week, E. coli 157. And we're gonna talk about norovirus again a little bit uh, later on uh, in the semester. But you can see these are kind of the, the important ones. And uh, usually you're looking at, like I said, fecal contamination of food, um, there's a whole variety of foods there. You can see uh, dairy, eggs, greens. It seems that no food category is, is safe, right? Um, I know I had this question a few years ago. I don't, maybe I was talking about this before. I can't remember if I was telling you guys about this, but there was that massive uh, uh, romaine lettuce recall about maybe three years ago, right? Of course, as soon as that happens, I'm like really craving Caesar salads, right? You can't find it anywhere, uh, but it took them a while to to find the source. So it was kind of recalled across the country. And uh, my question is, why is it romaine lettuce is always getting recalled? What is wrong with romaine lettuce? Is there something with the biology of it that it's attracting E. coli or, or, or something? And uh, so I spent a little bit of time kind of researching that. And the answer is, it's because it's popular, right? Lots of people are buying romaine lettuce, right? Um, so lots of it is sold. It's more likely to be one of the contaminated uh, sprouts, on the other hand, do have some biological mechanisms where the cells actually surround the bacteria and the bacteria can get into the sprouts. And because of that, I know some people that will never eat them because of the risk is, is higher for them. But anything that's uncooked, anything that has a potential to be exposed to um, uh, bacteria of a fecal nature uh, is, is, of course, um, um, fair game, right? Eggs, for example, come from birds, right? Birds have salmonella in their feces. And, uh, you know, if it's not washed properly by the, uh, by the egg producer, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, they recommend people don't eat raw cookie dough uh, because of the potential risk of salmonella. Uh, full disclaimer, I eat raw cookie dough all the time. I've never been sick from it. I love it. Probably will never stop. <laughs> um, but there is a risk, right? You know, just delicious. Uh, yeah, so... Um, I guess I said all that. I didn't realize that was sitting on there. So what's airborne, okay? So airborne is not this thing I'm gonna throw at you anymore. I didn't throw that anymore, right? For the record, no one got hurt. Okay, don't want anyone to get hurt by my demonstrations. Um, I, did have, I did have an instructor that was talking about virus transmission a long time ago, and he had a soccer ball, and like he literally booted out into the class, right? And thankfully it was Nerf, but he hit some guy in the head. <laughs> So that was kind of like, you know, that woke me up. I remember I was kind of half asleep and I woke up. I'm like, okay, I'm not falling asleep this lecture. <laughs> um, so airborne is more like if I had a bubble wand. I actually was trying to find a bubble wand here. And you can imagine I blow the bubbles and the gravity, like, you know, I mean, they will eventually fall down. But if there's a nice air current, you can imagine it will travel in the air current. Uh, maybe it would get up into the ventilation, uh, maybe go into the next room, because we're talking about very tiny dust particles. So we're talking about diseases like uh, like measles, for example. Um, if I had measles right now and I'm breathing the virus particles into the air, they will linger here for hours. So somebody could come three hours later and inhale that air, and if they were not immune, they could catch measles. So that's what airborne is. And this is one of the reasons why influenza transmits a little bit better in, in, the, um, uh, in the fall time, because uh, respiratory droplets can actually get dried up. And like I said, they get dried up to the point where they're small enough to actually be airborne. Um, not as much for, for influenza, um, but, um, but it certainly is the case, okay? 
And so, you know, that's kind of the difference between airborne and, and respiratory droplets. Like I said, think about that idea where they're on, you know, just drifting around on a dust particle for hours. Uh, so what diseases are we talking about here? Measles is kind of one of them. Uh, chicken pox as well. And, uh, you know, this is why when there's outbreaks in schools that happen every once in a while, they're finding out who's vaccinated, who's not, because, of course, uh, it can linger. Uh, you don't have to even be in the same class as that other student, and you are susceptible because it can float around, go through the, uh, the ductwork and whatnot. Um, tuberculosis is another interesting one. Um, usually bacterial organisms are a little bit heavier and bigger, and you think they're going to drop down. But there's actually been some interesting experiments done with tuberculosis with, I think it's guinea pigs or something, where literally they had guinea pigs in two different rooms with a connecting vent to see if it could transmit, and it did, right? So, uh, but usually tuberculosis is not something that is transmitted airborne, uh, kind of like 90% of the time it's more close contact, right? It's actually not, it's not a hugely, um, it's not really as infectious as a lot of other, other diseases, but, uh, and, and whatnot. Uh, I thought I had a thing. Yeah, I do have a thing here on uh, on SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus. Um, so, you know, we're talking about that six feet to two meters. And I know, I don't can't remember when this was, months ago, there was this massive, you know, document put by, put together by a bunch of physicians about the risk of it being airborne and all that. And, and it probably is, but we figure it's maybe about 10, five to 10% of the cases um, are airborne transmitted. Uh, there's enough people that, um, that have had it um, and they have no idea where they got it from. Now, that doesn't necessarily rule out fomites. You know, like everyone's touching doorknobs and things like that and, uh, and on all those kind of things. But there does seem to be some evidence that maybe 5 to 10% of cases are, um, are airborne. But the majority seem to be from close contact. And so they talk about uh, the biggest risk is uh, indoors um, where you're in close contact with someone for more than about 15 minutes. And that's just statistics showing us that. And that shows us that most of the uh, transmission is by direct contact or drop of contact, um, but that doesn't rule out the, uh, the aerosols or the fomites, which, like I said, are probably uh, less than 10% of all cases. Uh, so again, that's the statistics uh, and uh, kind of trying to uh, you know, tease apart what's going on with, with this coronavirus. So you know, these two people, maybe they're a little too close. And I saw um, you know, in, in Fort McMurray, you're supposed to imagine a bison you know, distance is about two meters because everyone knows exactly how big a bison is because we've all been, you know, we're all acquainted with them very intimately up here, right? You know, they're like squirrels. They run around, run around everywhere. So vehicle, right? We're looking at water, food, and air. Like I said, kind of the essentials um, and, and lots of examples there. Okay, last group is vector. Okay, so vector, we usually mean some sort of insect. Um, not always the case, um, but 99% of the time we're talking about some sort of insect. So we have it broken down into two categories. Mechanical. So mechanical, it means that that particular insect is not necessarily essential for, um, for that disease to be transmitted. And where you see this kind of thing happen uh, more commonly is, um, you know, where... Uh, where sanitation or, or other things are, are a big issue. So you can see over here, you've got, uh, you've got uh, looks like some, I don't know what that is, maybe some dog poo or something like that. And you've got a fly that has landed on it. And you can imagine on the, on the feet pads of the, of the insect, um, you know, there, there might there be some fecal matter and it's landing on the food, right? So you can imagine this is something that's a lot more common in places where there might be sanitation issues or, or, or something like that. So this does happen, uh, and mostly it's the same organisms that are causing uh, uh, waterborne and foodborne diseases because it's usually coming from, from fecal matter or something like that. Uh, so not usually um, a big one in Canada. Um, you know, we tend to have a lot of good sanitation and whatnot. Sometimes there are issues in people's homes, of course, uh, that, that may be the thing. Uh, big one that we're going to talk about now for a bit is biological. So that means that the, um, the vector, the, uh, the arthropod, is, uh, is essential for the transmission of that particular uh, pathogen. In many cases, it's essential for the life cycle. So there's a whole bunch here, tons and tons of vector-borne diseases. And uh, we're going to kind of just pick on, on two. 
because they're the two most important ones in Canada. But there's a whole bunch. We've talked about some of these already. Remember, we talked about malaria. We've talked about Chagas disease, African sleeping sickness. Uh, we talked about plague, uh, and they include all sorts of arthropods. So arthropods includes insects, but also includes things with eight legs, like ticks and, and spiders, although no spider-borne diseases, but you've also got a few other things. You can see we have, uh, what do we have here? Sand flies, ticks, mosquitoes, uh, true bugs, tsetse flies, fleas, black flies, aquatic, aquatic snails. So, you know, there's something that's not a, um, not a little insect, just putting in like that. So we're going to talk about um, the, not, the three top uh, vector-borne diseases in Canada are West Nile virus, Lyme disease, and uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We're not going to talk about Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, I think there's like 10 cases a year in Canada, if that. Uh, if you're in British Columbia, it's a little bit more important. We just don't have time to cover everything. But the other two are, are hugely important. So we're going to talk about those. Uh, I, I showed you this slide before and said, stay tuned. We're going to come back to it. And so here we are. Okay. So let's talk about Lyme disease. Um, this is something I've been really fascinated by for, for many years. Because um, I remember hearing about it for the first time. And uh, so where I grew up uh, in Northern Ontario, we have uh, something called wood ticks. Um, I hear there are ticks around here. Um, I've heard different names. I don't know what the scientific names are. People calling them dog ticks and moose ticks. Um, I've never had a tick on me here in Fort McMurray, but back home is really common, these wood ticks. And so the question is, you know, are these wood ticks actually transmitting this crazy new disease I'm, he I'm hearing about? And the answer is no, wood ticks don't transmit disease. But these ones do. These ones are called black-legged ticks. There's actually two different uh, varieties of them. There's the western black-legged tick, which is basically west of the Rockies. And then there's the other black-legged tick, which is kind of the rest of Canada. Uh, they go by many names. Sometimes people call them deer ticks and lime ticks and bear ticks. I've heard a bunch of different kind of common names that are regional. Deer tick is probably the most common um, name I've heard of them, and they do uh, bite deer. Uh, and, uh, and so that's kind of where the name comes from. Uh, and you can see there, there's a variety of different uh, life stages in the tick. You can see this tiny larva. Um, this is kind of interesting. The larva has six legs, right? Whereas all the other part stages have eight legs. So, so ticks are not insects, but um, they do have a six-legged stage, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, and you can see the size of them. They are super, super tiny. That's a Canadian dime. So once you take a look at the, uh, the nymph size, so notice the nymph size, it says it is about as big as a poppy seed. So picture a poppy seed. And if you like poppy seed muffins, then don't pay attention to this next part. <laughs> so there are five ticks on there. Can you see them? <laughs> right? Would I notice a poppy seed if it was like on my skin? Right? Probably not. We can zoom in. Maybe, maybe can you see them? Yeah, there they are right there. So this is done by the CDC in the States, and people were outraged. They were like, you have ruined obviously muffins for life for me. Here we go. Um, but, uh, but it's actually it's a great image because, uh, um, you know, most people are thinking, like I said, I'm, I'm thinking about wood ticks, right? And a wood tick is uh, trying to think of something the size, but it's very visible. Um, much larger than these ones. Uh, and in fact, the adult stages of the black-legged ticks are, are uh, not quite as big as a wood tick, but, uh, but getting there. Whereas the nymph stage is super, super tiny. And that's the stage that is most likely to infect a human, unfortunately. Um, I'll talk about wh uh, why that is in a moment. Uh, like I said, they're most commonly associated with deer because you're seeing the adult stage on the deer. And there's a deer that has, I don't know how well you can see that picture from the back, but that's a whole bunch of ticks all around, um, all around the ears there. And uh, if you have dogs, sometimes people have dogs and they get the ticks and they get swollen up. And you can see there's a swollen up, up tick there. Anyone ever have to do that? Take a tick off a dog? Yeah, fun, eh? Yeah, I remember doing it with the wood ticks and literally I found one on my dog the size of a grape. Like a grape, right? And you're just like <laughs> pulling it off. Ugh. Anyway. Like these things are like literally blood sucking parasites, right? You know, they're, they're just, there's nothing not creepy about these. So I just want to kind of briefly talk about the life cycle. This is the part that I find really fascinating, um, um, but we'll try not to get in too many details on it. But if you take a look at this, right? You've got these ticks, they lay their eggs and the eggs hatch and you get a larva. 
And what does the larva do? Um, it's on the ground. It's not very mobile. It finds a creature that's close to the ground. So the number one creature for, um, for this tick is, uh, the, or sorry, they like mice. It's not the number one creature necessarily for, for the tick. Ticks are not picky, by the way. Mosquitoes are picky. I don't know if people knew that. There's like 3,000 species of, of, of uh, mosquitoes on the planet. Only 300 will actually bite humans. And of that, only 80 actually prefer humans. And by the way, they prefer brunettes over blondes. Anyway, are picky, but if there's, you know, if there's, if there's no, if there's no brunettes around, they will bite blondes. <laughs> so don't worry, you know, that will happen. But ticks don't care. You have blood, and you are in the right place at the right time. They're on you, right? The thing is, they can't fly. So mice are a favorite of these things. And, uh, and there we go. And so the number one species that we're concerned about is something called the white-footed mouse. And why the white-footed mouse? Because the white-footed mouse is the reservoir for the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. These mice can live happy with the bacteria in their blood, and they're fine. So at this point, it's feeding on the mouse, and it can pick up the bacterium that causes Lyme disease. And I'll talk about that bacterium in a moment. So notice it's going to feed on the mouse. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sleep for a while. Like, I think this is actually a whole winter it sleeps, basically, and it emerges as a nymph. And so the nymph now has the bacterium and can go infect somebody, like the human, right? And so that's why the nymph is the stage we're most concerned about, because they're super tiny. The good news is, if you do get bitten by a nymph, um, the process where they embed themselves under your skin is really long. Like, it takes 24 to 36 hours. So generally what they say, if you go for a walk or a hike into an area that you think, or, you know, um, that might have ticks, uh, you know, have a shower afterwards. Um, you know, sometimes people say throw your clothes in the dryer and whatnot, and that will probably deal with it. Or if you discover one and it's been less than 24 hours, um, you're going to remove it, hold on to it, okay, put it in a plastic bag, and that can actually be, uh, be sent off, or you can bring it to your, your doctor's office, and they can actually uh, identify whether it's the right species of tick as well. And I'll talk about tick surveillance in a moment. Uh, then it's going to bite uh, a larger animal. And this is where the deer come in, right? Because now they are, uh, um, they're a little bit more able and uh, they can actually you know, climb a little better. Sometimes they climb up on leaves or grass. And this is where I've seen wood ticks. I remember a few years ago in the fall, um, going for a hike and, and like looking down. And you know, there's, there's grass about this high, like the brown dried up grass in the fall, or sorry, in the, sorry, in the spring. It was in the spring from the previous year. It was brown and dry. And I'm looking, and there they are. There's like three of them just sitting there, you know, reaching out their little claws, you know. You know it actually has a name, by the way. Well, I always call it questing. <laughs> uh, it's kind of weird. But they don't jump or anything. They just sit there, and their claws are kind of, they got little sticky sticky things on them. And then, uh, so, they, you know, they, they like deer. Uh, but anybody who goes by, dog, human, whatever, they're fine. And eventually, that's where they're going to meet. So that's where the romance happens. The male and the female, they, you know, they do their thing and produce the eggs and all that. So that's kind of the life cycle. So we're most concerned about the, the mice because that's the natural reservoir where the bacteria can actually live. Let's talk about the organism for a couple of minutes. It's called Borrelia burgdorferi. So uh, burgdorferi was the name of some guy, um, kind of a... Uh, um, that's where that came from. Borelli, I can't remember what that means, but they're spirochetes. So that means they have a twisty shape to them. And, uh, and uh, they, they uh, have the ability to, to move into tissues and, and migrate from one part of the body to another. So the number one symptom of Lyme disease is the bullseye rash. So we think you've got about an 80 to 85% chance of having this rash if you get infected by, um, by this organism. And the good news is, if you have this rash, there's like nothing else that makes this rash in Canada. So if you have that rash, the diagnosis, like take a picture of it, show it to your healthcare provider. It's like, yeah, it's Lyme disease, right? And you can treat it. Right, with, with antibiotics. We can kill this thing with antibiotics, and that's good. And you want to get treated the sooner the pop, as, as soon as you can. Um, so what is this rash caused by? It's actually caused, um, it, it's not necessarily the site of the bite, right? It's actually an inflammation around a lymph node. 
So commonly people have had it, you know, on the back of the knee or other areas of the lymph node, the armpits and things like that in the groin where uh, lymph nodes are, are more common. Uh, and then other kind of very typical uh, symptoms from infection. So fevers and chills. And some of those people end up with uh, kind of like aches in their knees and joints and things like that. Um, so if you have the bullseye's rash, it is Lyme disease, get it treated right away. Uh, like I said, the problem is that this organism has the ability to migrate to all sorts of other tissues. And this is where we end up with, um, with issues where people start to have uh, other things. And you can see the, the list is long and scary. Some things aren't too bad, headaches, nephs, stick sticks, okay, that's, that's livable, but it can get into the heart, it can get into uh, the nerves, cause uh, things like Bell's palsy and, and things like that. And uh, like I said, lots of, lots of scary things go on here with, uh, uh, with Lyme disease if it's uh, not treated um, right away. And um, if you happen to be a famous Canadian celebrity, you're also at risk, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if anyone gets the joke there, but Shania Twain, uh, Avril Lavigne, and Justin Bieber are all famous Canadian celebrities that had, uh, had to deal with uh, undiagnosed Lyme disease and ended up with uh, uh, um, you know, some long-term effects. All three of them, if, you, if you're following their, their careers, um, took pretty significant breaks in their, in, their, in their musical careers, like two years, um, to eventually get diagnosed and deal with it. Uh, there is a, a long-term effects on some people with Lyme disease. It's not an infection anymore because the, the bacteria only lasts around for so long, but uh, uh, we believe that some of the long-term effects have to do with these immune reactions and, and collateral damage and and uh, it's an autoimmune response is what we think is going on, uh, which is a whole nother story, which I, I cannot get into everything there. So the real question is, where can you get Lyme disease? If this was 1982, the only place you could get Lyme disease was somewhere right about, uh, right about there. So Lake Ontario, there's this one point that's, that sort of goes far down. I think it's called Long Point or something like that. Um, but we're not in 1982 anymore. Turns out the tick has spread, and there's a lot of uh, decent evidence to show that this has partly to do with climate change, um, because of course the tick itself has to survive the Canadian winters. And, uh, and now it's kind of like um, a lot of places. The hot spots, though, are over here in Eastern Canada. So we're talking about uh, uh, Southeastern Ontario, uh, parts of Quebec, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, New Brunswick. Uh, those are the big ones. I don't know if it's actually made it to Prince Edward Island. Anyone here for PEI could tell me? I think it's not quite there yet. There are cases, but they're believed to be imported. Notice Alberta is pretty good, but it is spreading. Um, so there's Northern Ontario, kind of that area that's close to Manitoba. That's where I grew up. Uh, that was something that was not found there. And now it's, uh, it's a lot more frequent um, to find those ticks there. And, uh, and have cases of Lyme disease. My aunt had Lyme disease in 2007. I think I mentioned before that uh, they didn't even believe her um, because even, you know, this is not that long ago, 15 years ago, um, the thought was it's not found in that region yet. And now it's definitely the case. Uh, some areas of British Columbia as well uh, seem to be hot spots. So Alberta is pretty good for uh, so far. I made this map, by the way. I couldn't find a good map, so I had to color it. I hope you like it. Um, I'll show you some other maps. I found this on CTV. This was kind of a, 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 pr a prediction. I was going to try to reach out to them, figure where they got the data from, but didn't have a, like an author, right? It just was CTV, right? But I'll show you, this is kind of some of the predictions. Uh, it's kind of old data, but where they think it's going to be. So there's 2000, this was a 2020 projection. So thankfully we're not there yet. Notice they're missing British Columbia entirely, which is kind of like weird. But uh, this is the projection if they're talking about, um, um, they're talking about uh, pr projections in, in uh, and global temperatures and climate change. And so, so Alberta is not going to be safe forever. And uh, I'll show you the numbers of cases for Alberta here in a second. All right, so there is the number of cases of Lyme disease in Canada. Uh, we did have cases before 2009, but before 2009, we didn't really keep good records. It wasn't a reportable disease. Um, it was officially and legally a reportable disease in 2009. There are probably more cases. Um, how many, we're not sure. Uh, I looked it up and there are two studies. One study estimates we're only, only um, getting 20% of the cases. Another study estimates we're only getting half of the amount of cases. So it's hard to tell. Um, I've definitely met people that said, yes, I definitely had that bullseye rash years ago. I didn't know it was Lyme disease. Now I, I think it was, but they never got diagnosed. I've met people with that exact story. So you can see there's a, a trend. It's going upwards. Um, 
by, by quite a bit. And uh, so here's the Alberta numbers. Pretty low, that's great. 132 cases uh, recorded up until 2020. Um, if we look at 2019, I don't, I can't get all the, I can't get the data for 2020 yet. There were 14 cases of Lyme disease. All of the cases in Alberta, we have believed, were imported. So somebody traveled to Nova Scotia and they came back, or they went to Montana and they came back, and that seems to be the case so far. Uh, we have found the ticks here. So ticks, I was telling you, you know, they, you got blood, they'll, they'll bite you, no problem. Um, and a lot of those ticks have also been imported. People bring their dogs when they go on holidays or wherever. Uh, and ticks will actually, uh, they will actually like latch onto birds and birds migrate all over the place. Um, people in Yellowknife were freaking out about five years ago because one of the ticks was found up there and they're like, there's no way these ticks can survive up there. Probably came on a bird. Um, we don't know. Ticks seem to be like that. Uh, the evidence suggests that they're not, um, you know, if you're in Yellowknife, uh, they're not, they don't seem to be uh, breeding there. But uh, uh, they, they do seem to move, right? So th this is where we're at, anyway. Uh, I thought I had, oh, I was going to show you a map looking at the tick surveillance. Uh, there's kind of two tick surveillance um, uh, streams. One is through human health, so people submitting them to uh, um, um, healthcare providers. Uh, and there's a couple of repositories in, in town. I think there's one in Fort Mackay as well. And then other people submitting ticks to veterinarians. Right, because of course this is where we're getting ticks off of dogs. Um, and I was going to show you a map because the the most recent data showed I think it was 2018. There were three ticks found in Fort McMurray, and and the map even shows where the tick was reported to be found. One of them was near the uh, Sobies in uh, in Thickwood, <laughs> so probably found off a dog. It didn't say that, but anyway, that was where the tick was found. Uh, there's um. All sorts of tick awareness stuff nowadays. Uh, I was in Canadian Tire a few weeks ago and, and I saw like this tool here, right? Um, it was on the shelf. I, I, I took a photo of it, but I couldn't find the photo, so I just found one on, on the internet. And this is a tick removal photo. And notice it's got the little magnifying glass as well. But usually they're recommending, you know, people, you wear pants uh, in, in tick season, you know, which is June, July in some areas and, and those kind of things, right? And uh, wearing, uh, um, a repellent and, and whatnot. But if you're in Alberta, like I said, the risk is minimal. Um, other places you go, it's much higher. I was just reading about uh, uh, Lyme disease cases in, um, uh, in, in Ottawa, right? And it used to be that they got the ticks and they would test them for the bacteria. And uh, 10 years ago, it was maybe 25% of the ticks actually had the bacteria. They're not even doing that anymore because they're just assuming it's 100%. Um, the number of cases in Ottawa, I don't know why Ottawa in particular apparently have skyrocketed dramatically. So I don't know what the, what the context is there. Okay, so that's it for Lyme disease for now. Uh, like I said, I go on about Lyme disease for a while, um, but we've got to talk about other diseases and the most dangerous animal in the world, which of course is the mosquito. Um, think about how many it is huge, All right? So there's a stat I found. I don't know whether that's still true. The number of cases of malaria worldwide have actually been plummeting in the last five to ten years, um, partly due to mosquito control and uh, humanitarian efforts, and you know, distributing things like uh, uh, bug, uh, mosquito nets, for example. World Vision apparently has distributed hundreds of thousands of these mosquito nets, so people sleep with a net over their bed. That prevents the mosquitoes getting in in the nighttime. Uh, so the number of cases has, has plummeted uh, quite dramatically. Uh, so lots of mosquito-borne diseases. So we talked about malaria a little bit. Um, there's a whole bunch out there that thankfully uh, are not really a big deal in Canada because, like I said before, how do you get rid of tropical diseases? Winter. <laughs> so we have winter. Um, but you know, some that you may have heard of, yellow fever. Uh, Zika was making the news a few years ago quite a bit, dengue fever, uh, and there's a whole bunch out there. Some of them are, are uh, geographically uh, isolated, let's say to Australia or, or things like that. So West Nile is the one that we want to talk about now for a few minutes because uh, it's relevant uh, to Canada. Um, I, just a little segue about mosquitoes. Um, there are, like I said, about 3,000 species, and they actually include uh, uh, three different uh, genuses. 
right? In terms of their biology, there's, they're different enough uh, significantly. Um, the one we're going to talk about for West Nile is called the Culex mosquito, of which there's two versions. Uh, the one version is called the common house mosquito. So you can imagine where that's found. And, uh, and both of these mosquitoes kind of appreciate humans because we provide uh, things like barns and warmer areas for them to actually survive the winter. Uh, doesn't take much, right, for, for them to find a, a place that's going to allow them to survive the winter, even though many of them are killed. The Anopheles mosquito is the one that's relevant for malaria, um, of which uh, we do have some in Canada and some of the warmer parts of Ontario and eastern provinces. Uh, you can find the Anopheles mosquito, but it's not carrying the parasite. So that's the good news. Uh, the the uh, Aedes mosquitoes, uh, Aedes aegypti, for example, is the one that transmits a Zika and, and a whole bunch of other uh, mostly flabby viruses. And that includes all of those, all of those nasty. Okay, so let's talk about West Nile. I mentioned West Nile is a bird disease. So it's bird, mosquito, bird, mosquito. That's kind of generally what's going on with this particular disease, okay? Uh, some birds more um, will, will uh, harbor the virus better than others. Uh, typical ones are the, uh, the robin, which is just kind of found everywhere all over North America. Um, and I'm not sure what other species are, but I know the robin is a common one. And it's also common enough that it's found in um, um, cities and towns as well, right? Sometimes there's not a bird around and the mosquitoes bite other things, right? So for whatever reason, um, my understanding is that West Nile virus is more common in humans during hot, dry summers. And I think what happens in hot, dry summers is the birds just, they're like, they can fly. It's like, let's find a wetter spot and they're off and the mosquitoes are just desperate, right? And uh, to find a blood meal. Uh, so this is uh, this can be quite serious in horses, which is why the horse is on there, and the horse industry people um, talk about it all the time, and of course in humans. So it doesn't usually um, spread from human to human. Like I said, in some rare cases there's been blood transfusion transmission, and uh, and that and that can be a big deal. And I think there have been cases where it has traveled from mother to fetus, but I'd have to look that one up to confirm that. So West Nile fever, you can imagine, it gives you a fever and other flu-like symptoms. So flu-like symptoms, including things like aches and uh, extreme fatigue, and that's pretty typical. Most people who get West Nile fever, it's actually, they think they have a mild flu. That's kind of it. Uh, some people who get it, get encephalitis. So they're talking um, uh, uh, inflammation of the, of the brain, and that's where it can be very, very serious and can lead to death, uh, particularly in elderly people that are more susceptible to, uh, to these infections. Um, now that people kind of know what to look for and what season to watch it for, uh, it's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, we usually know how to treat it. So this is the case where you know, an elderly person comes in with flu-like symptoms in, in July, and um, they, they prescribe them steroids just to kind of calm down the immune system and to allow the person to kind of get through the whole process. Uh, for the most part, like I said, not as serious as, um, and it was one of these things that scared people 20 years ago when it first arrived to, to North America. Uh, where's West Nile virus found? Um, most of the provinces, again. Uh, I mentioned there were two types of mosquitoes, Culex mosquitoes. So we have the, uh, the uh, house mosquito here, northern house mosquito, uh, kind of found in the eastern provinces. I don't know why there's a bit of a gap over here where it doesn't seem to be found. And then what's this other one called? Um, the western encephalitis mosquito. Um, the, the, the house mosquito, likes human places a bit more in terms of that's where it hide out, hides out in the winter. Um, the, um, the Western encephalitis mosquito, uh, my understanding, it really likes agriculture. So for example, it breeds in water, like all mosquitoes, but uh, you, know, you can imagine in, in farms, there's ditches and there's hoof marks from cows and, and you know, it, 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 uh, it kind of likes filthy water is my understanding on that kind of thing. But anyway, that's where it is, Alberta. We're looking at mostly, I know this map goes pretty high, but in terms of Alberta, 90 something percent of the cases are all like way, way down. We're talking about Medicine Hat uh, area is where most of the cases are, Lethbridge kind of thing. Uh, so again, in terms of the distribution, it can be pretty far, but most of the, most of the, the, the transmission is kind of in that, that lower part of Alberta. So it's good to be north, right? We're all happy winter's coming, yay, right? <laughs> Um, so what about Zika, right? Uh, I had some people ask me about this. The good news is the mosquito Aedes aegypti doesn't seem to survive in Canada uh, at all. 
Um, bad news is they did find um, they did find one in some mosquito trap in Ontario like last year. Uh, so the mosquito can, you know, over the summer they can drift all around, maybe travel on birds and things like that. But probably we're not going to be concerned about Zika for a long time in Canada. Uh, but uh, southern United States, you can see it is uh, there is some transmission. Um, I'm not sure how how many cases, but uh, it is something that uh, that they are watching and are concerned about. Okay, so where are we with time? Okay, a little bit behind schedule here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, um, other types of uh, kind of scenarios where transmission of disease is increased. Uh, one area is uh, hospitals. So we call this a nosocomial infection or a hospital acquired infection. Infection. I don't know why we have a special word for it, nosocomial, but that's the term that's used. Sometimes you see an abbreviation, uh, a hospital acquired, right, H-A-I, right? So sometimes you see um, these, these abbreviations. Uh, and, and they're changing it now to be healthcare associated because, of course, not all these infections are in hospitals. There's all sorts of other healthcare um, settings, right? And uh, we're looking at, uh, I mentioned the stat here about people who stay in a hospital there's about a 10% chance that you're going to get a secondary infection just because you're in the hospital. And uh, the numbers range, but that 10% number has been around forever. And it seems no matter what we do, we can't improve on it too much. Maybe some hospitals get down to 5%, but that 10%, that number has been hovering around for a long, long time. Um, okay, so how do we, why is this? There's actually a number of variables as to why we're, we, these hospital acquired infections are a big deal and why they happen. You can see number, number one is that uh, just in the hospital, there might be germs, right? All sorts of pathogens. Some of them may be superbugs, um, but you have sick people there and they're, you know, they're, they're doing their stuff, right? They're vomiting, they're sneezing, they're, they're coughing, uh, and all those uh, lead to the presence of those organisms in the hospital. Uh, number two is... Um, you have people that are moving from room to room, right? Hospital staff, um, equipment, whatnot, and these can, can basically act as vectors, right? A guess, whatever it could be. Number three, people are already ill. So they're susceptible, they're compromised. Um, you know, their immune system is weakened, they're already you know, trying to suffer through something else, right? Number four, is just due to some of the procedures done in hospitals. Um, in terms of hospital acquired infections, I'll show you a graph in a second here, uh, but you can imagine some of the invasive procedures done. Catheters, for example, are super, super common. So now you are literally sticking something into somebody's urinary tract, and if that is not sterile, um, that is a risk factor, okay? Um, surgeries, uh, all sorts of other invasive procedures can potentially introduce pathogens to uh, susceptible hosts. I told you I have some graphs here and some other information. So um, frequency, I've, I've looked at a whole bunch of these charts. The numbers are always different every single time. Um, usually the urinary tract infections is number one. So like I said, catheters, that's kind of a big deal. Um, it's very, very common, very easy to contaminate. Uh, even if the catheter tube itself is sterile, um, you know, the person, uh, you know, uh, this is their genital area where there may likely to be uh, some pathogens, particularly from the feces, right? Uh, it's just, that's the way it is. It's all down there, all one spot, unfortunately. Uh, bloodstream, surgical, and those kind of things. Uh, you can see the pathogens that are common, and uh, these, uh, these ones I have in red um, are the most important ones, and everything in bold are things that we're talking about this semester. Um, but these four here, Staphylococcus, uh, e. coli, Pseudomonas and Enterococci, uh, pretty much every time I've seen a list, they're always the top four, always, always the top four. Uh, and it's just that they're common enough. Staphylococcus is found on skin, right? E. coli is found on feces. And they also, these organisms are very good at infecting multiple uh, body systems as well when given the opportunity. So that's kind of the thing, right? So what do we do about these things? Honestly, number one is hand washing, getting everyone to wash their hands. All the rest of this stuff, you know, is pretty common kind of uh, 
uh, typical um, hospital procedures, right? You know, cleaning up after people, disinfecting. Um, sometimes it involves patient isolation, uh, you know, those kind of things, uh, monitoring outbreaks and all that. And uh, like the number one thing that can be done is hand washing, right? And um, that is probably the hardest thing to do, right? How are you gonna get every single visitor to wash his or her hands? Like, how do you do that? <laughs> you, can't, you, you can't follow them around and enforce it. Uh, so you have signs everywhere, you have um, hand sanitizer stations, you, you, you do your best. And, but that's kind of one of the big things that can be done. And then all these other things, like I said, are kind of uh, a standard procedures. And um, that's why some hospitals are more successful than others is because they have either better enforcement of, of these procedures, or sometimes just the design around the standard operating procedures is going to, is going to help out, uh, you know, in terms of isolation of infectious patients, right? If you have a full hospital, where are you going to isolate a patient? You have no rooms, right? Um, and so some hospitals, newer ones, you know, they have special isolation areas that are designed for this kind of thing and, and so on. That's the problem, by the way, when hospitals get full, uh, when hospital hits about 75% capacity, uh, quite honestly, all hell breaks loose. Um, that's where you have serious issues where it suddenly gets way harder to control all of these hospital acquired infections. You know, this is why, um, you know, right now, Alberta is, I don't know if we're still in a state of emergency over COVID-19, um, but you have uh, the hospitals, the um, in intensive care and, and other uh, beds are, are, are uh, at higher capacity. And now you're looking at all these secondary infections and all these other um, things that can be uh, massive issues. Um, I found this, this has been the textbook. It's talking about other recommendations. Uh, you can take a look at that. It's kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more specific about what's being done with certain equipment like disposing of mouthpieces and things like that. And uh, like I said, a lot of kind of standard procedures for dealing with these kind of infections. Okay, so I'm gonna finish off kind of just um, talking about um, defining emerging infectious diseases and we'll go through these examples next day. Uh, but this is something that uh, healthcare, uh, public health is always keeping an eye on and something that microbiologists are always concerned about is emerging infectious diseases or re-emerging infectious diseases. These are things that, um, that may not, you know, not necessarily be on the radar for most people, but have the potential to suddenly just arrive. Right? And there's a whole bunch of contributing factors to this that I'm going to kind of get into next day. Um, but you can imagine that, for example, this coronavirus, this was an emerging infectious disease. This was something we didn't know even existed until uh, recently, and uh, it came from an animal source. So these are things that we're always concerned about. Uh, next day, like I said, I'm going to talk about uh, um, some of these scenarios a little bit. Uh, you can see, for example, increasing population densities, right? Um, you know, this is something that's obvious. The more people you have, uh, the more diseases float around. So, for example, when all the kids go back to school in September, uh, you know, they didn't have a sniffle all summer. Suddenly, it seems like every other week they're getting getting sick because um, people are congregating together. Uh, we're going to talk about things like uh, new strains. So, we'll talk a little bit about uh, H1N1 that happened 10 years ago, and uh, and a few other kind of things related to emerging infectious diseases. So, so we'll finish this topic next day, and then we'll uh, we'll start the next topic as well. And um, I'll try to get those midterms graded for Tuesday as well. So.